Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, today I'm just going to respond to a comment that came up under one of my videos and uh, it was bugging me. And it just, it's, I've been trying to talk about this brothers and sisters in Christ and saying here's the example, here's the example, and it's just bugging me, the people that make comments like this. So I want to respond to a comment, show you what God was show, talking to me in the last few days, and then ask you guys, uh, I have a teaching here that I haven't done. I've had it, I've had it for a long time. I've had it for about a year sitting here, touching on it here and there, but I always hold off, and I'll tell you why I hold off doing this teaching. And I want, I'm going to ask brothers in, uh, in Christ uh, your opinion, based off the scriptures, if I should do this study. Okay, and I'll explain it a little bit more. I'm trying to be vague right now because I want to get into it when we get to this part. But it's three parts, and they all kind of line up together. Okay. But we're going to start with this. Under, I realized that YouTube, okay, um, YouTube is not letting me know everyone that's making comments again. I haven't had to put up with it for a while, so maybe it has been going on for a while. So, Brother Sister Christ, if you've seen comments where someone's attacking me and he doesn't answer it because he doesn't have an answer, um, maybe I don't know that that person made a comment. Okay, there's comments not showing up. It's not showing up in the program that you go into that you look at all the comments made recently. Um, there's times, I know a lot of you brothers and sisters Christ understand in the comment section when you go under the word sort, uh, it'll say um, top comments is what automatically comes up. And it'll say there's two comments, but you only see one. Then you click on sort by and you say newest first, all of a sudden, boom, now there's two comments like it says there's two comments. Uh, the comments is, is, is not working again. Okay. But I got this comment under the video, uh, that I, the Bible teaching that I did about have you exhorted a brother in Christ lately? And I was shocked. I got some thumbs down on that. And like I said, I got in the previous, uh, we were talking about a testimony from a brother in Christ and did the encouragement to keep praying for one another, the prayer request videos, and more than anything, to keep it in your mind and in your heart, God's Word, when it talks about prayer and how important prayer is in the life of a Christian. A Bible-believing, God-fearing man, part of the Church of God, the Bride of Christ, a saved sinner. God, I want to go through all of it, because some people are fighting things that aren't worth fighting. Um, the prayer is very important. And we talked about that, how someone made a negative comment under here and then deleted it. And then deleted it. <laughs> it's like, I wanted to talk about it to try to explain it. But yet another person, I can't remember if it's the same person came back and made the comment again. A, a different comment. Or if it's a different person. Because I just don't remember the, the person's name. I didn't write it down or anything. I was just going to talk about it. Okay. But under that uh, video, I got a comment from a person's title is Ambassador of Jesus Christ. He's not really, we're going to find out he's not really an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Okay. And what I mean by that ambassador, let's read. I wish I had the program where I could show you, I do, but it's acting up on me, where I can show my little square at the bottom video and then you can see the screen of the computer. Maybe one of these days a brother in Christ will connect with me on a video chat program where he knows a lot about the computer and these programs like OBS and everything and maybe he can help me fix it. But right now I'm doing it this way because this is the only way I know how to do it. But his title says Ambassador of Jesus Christ four days ago edited. It says four days ago but I just saw it today. Okay, um, And it's edited. First it was taken down maybe he just hit it or something I don't know. But now it says it's edited. But this is what he says. Why are you still still trying to teach knowing that you are divorced? And we'll talk about that. Knowing that you are divorced. Better check yourself. Now, brother, I say that about myself. I say that about you. That's always good advice. Check yourself. Now we talked about um, communion. Uh, prove your own selves. Uh, the Bible says to um, check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. So you check to see whether you're in the faith, your words, your beliefs, your stance, and prove your own selves that you're living it. That's always good advice. Better check yourself. And we're going to show. I truly believe you are a false convert. Eh, stop right there. Yeah, I made the noise. Eh, that's red alarms going off. Wait a second. 
why are you correcting me on teaching when I'm divorced, but then you turn around and say I'm a false convert? You shouldn't be telling someone, hey, you can't teach because you're divorced. Uh, if you're trying to teach the Word of God as a lost person, you don't preach the Word of God until you get truly saved and born again. Period. See, that's the right response. But I'm not allowed to teach because I'm divorced. But then he says, I truly believe that you're a false convert and you are leading many astray from the true gospel. That's why I said the red lights start going off. Something's not right with this person. He says, and he capitalizes it all. Stop teaching a works-based salvation. Catholic in, Catholic in the closet. I guess I'm a closet Catholic. Okay? I've only ever preached the Word of God. This is my foundation. Where I'm wrong, by all means, show me I'm wrong according to the Scriptures. That's always been my thing. I am a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. A saved sinner. This is my foundation. God is my foundation through His perfect written Word. If I'm wrong about something, prove it to me through the Word. Okay? But stop teaching works-based salvation. Catholic in the closet. Then he says 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 16. Okay, We're going to get into this. I'm going to show my responses real quick. I can't show. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the video program working. But I'm going to let you know what my responses were. Okay. Now, first thing I did was John 8, 47. I always throw this down. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Why do I always throw that down? Here's a man who says, my qualification for not teaching is that I'm divorced. Oh, by the way, I don't believe you're saved. I think the number one qualification for me not being able to preach, if I'm lost, is because I'm lost, not saved. And did you notice in that whole thing, he, his, his name says Ambassador for Jesus Christ. He's an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We're at in that comment, he says, I'm lost. We're at in that comment, did he, he preach the gospel to me? We're at. It's not there. So much for being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. The whole point the Bible talks about us being ambassadors is we're supposed to be a living witness which is what we're going to get into here, a living witness and a verbal witness. He's not even, remember I always talk, complain a little bit, brother, says Christ, we come across people that are just verbal and they don't, you know, in words and not in deeds, that you need both. This guy's not even in word. Okay? He's not even preaching the gospel to me. He's not preaching the truth using the scriptures, showing me where I'm wrong. All he says is that I'm lost. I believe you're a false convert. Yeah, well, there's people who believe that they're animals today. <laughs> Look how insane it is out there. Your beliefs mean nothing if they don't have a foundation. They don't have a foundation. Yeah, your beliefs need to line up with the foundation, which is God's perfect written word of God. Okay? Or else your beliefs mean nothing. So he didn't preach the gospel to me. So I always put that down there because as, as ambassador of Jesus Christ, you're supposed to be preaching the gospel. If, you believe, if he truly believes I'm lost, telling me to quit teaching isn't what you tell someone who's lost. You let them know that they're sinning, that their sins, that they've sinned against God, it's going to send them to hell. But James 1.21, I put, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Because I don't teach a false gospel. And if he doesn't believe the gospel of the King James Bible, then he's part of easy believism, or he's part of works-based salvation. Okay? Because he tries to say, I do it. But if he's not going off the scripture, he teaches he's earned salvation with his faith, faith alone, faith alone, or he's earning salvation with his works, one or the other. They're both um, work-based salvation. You've earned, it's faith alone, you've earned salvation with your faith. But is that what the scripture says? No. And we've proven this. I don't teach works-based. I didn't earn salvation. I have a changed life today because I'm saved, because God is my commander and my chief. He's my capital L Lord. He's my capital K King. He's my master. He's my savior. He's my friend. 
The Bible says, Jesus said, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. It all comes down to what God commands us. Starting with obeying the gospel, which I'm getting ahead of myself. I threw in here Psalms 111.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. For some reason, fearing the Lord and doing His commandments seem to go hand in hand. There's people who verbally say, I fear the Lord, but how are they living? How many of you heard people out there say, I fear God, I fear God. Yet you look at the life they're living, they don't fear God. Not in deed, in words, but not in deed. A lot of time in the Bible, when you talk, hear about fearing God, it has to do with, it's the beginning of wisdom. And that's the teaching I'm working on, right? It's the beginning of wisdom. Why? Because it gets you to listen to God and obey Him. Because you fear Him. True fear in God is the beginning of wisdom. All right? A good understanding have all day to do His commandments. He prayed, His praises endureth forever. Where's the fear of God in this man? Romans 10, 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. What's the number one command today? That we obey the gospel for the whole world. Obey the gospel. Here's the true plan of salvation. Here, you have to come to God on His terms. And that's what they don't like. We say, here's God's terms. And they say, I don't want God's terms. So I'm going to accuse you of being a workspace salvationist so I don't have to come to God on His terms. What are God's terms? Well, I'm going to go through the gospel that I preach, that He says is a, is a false gospel. It's works-based. Repentance. 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay, I'm quoting from the King James Bible, God's perfect written word for the English-speaking people. God's perfect written word. Repentance. They always try to take this out or pervert what it means. They change the definition of the, of the word repent, slash repentance, or they will do away with it completely as it applies to salvation. Remember, when God repents, change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. Remember that. We did, we did a study on this on the Old Testament. I can't, I'm not going to go through the scriptures hardcore, but remember that. They can't distinguish between the two. And what they do is, is they take out how man repents and tries to act like they're lowercase g gods. What did uh, Satan tell Eve? Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. So repentance is just a change of mind. How many of you heard that? Well, that's what God does. Am I God? No. I have a change of heart. Man has a change of heart. That's why the Bible doesn't contradict. First it says God repents, and then it says God is not man that he should repent. What's that talking about? God's not a sinner like man is. God has a change of mind. Man needs to have a change of heart. That's what the Bible's talking about. But here's the number one verse for as it applies to salvation today, how to get saved today. And they can't handle this word, to salvation. Let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. In other words, it has to come before. That sorrow for that sin, your personal sins, you've sinned against God, has to come and lead to repentance, the change of heart towards God about your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. It has to happen. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. It has to be towards God, not towards the consequences of sin. Not towards your life being a complete mess because of your sins. But you have to have sorrow towards the man that you've sinned against. Jesus Christ, which is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. You've sinned against God Almighty. That's where your sorrow needs to be directed towards. But a lot of times today, it's like... Um, was it um, Esau, where Esau sought repentance night and day with tears. Why? Because he was more sorrowful about the consequences of his actions, his sin, the cost of his sin. He was too focused on that and wouldn't let go of his sin, and he was just sorry for the consequences. If there was no consequences, he wouldn't have been sorry. And you have a lot of people like that. It's not about the consequences. It's about the man that you've wronged. Remember, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God manifests in the flesh. You have wronged God Almighty. That's who you're supposed to be sorry towards. Verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. 
It has to come before salvation or you don't get saved. That's what the Bible's saying when it says to salvation. Repentance has to happen before salvation and true biblical repentance is coming to God, falling on your knees, saying, I am a dirty, wicked, filthy sinner and having sorrow for that sin. This easy believism world, they go, well, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. That's not repentance. Coming to God saying, I'm a sinner, is not repentance. Repentance is coming to God saying, I am sorry for being a sinner, for sinning against you. I'm sorry for the consequences and fearing the consequences. That's there. But ultimately, repentance is having sorrow for sinning against God. And it has to happen before salvation. Why? But the sorrows of the world worketh death. The number one reason people don't get saved, the sorrows of the world. There's something in this world that's holding them back and trying to prevent them from coming to God broken. As a sinner, broken, sorrowful. Sorrow happens here, not here. Repentance isn't a change of mind, it's a change of heart. This is where the sorrow happens. When you've sinned against God, this is where it happens. But they have people believe it's just up here, it's just a change of mind. It's just going from unbelief to belief. So let's just take repentance out altogether because we're not going to say believe and believe. That seems stupid. We're just going to say believe. Only believe. They take repentance out. What happens when you take any step out of the gospel? You, 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 keep, pe you lead people astray where they won't get saved unless they truly want to get saved. God will still show you the truth eventually. But their whole job is to get you messed up and off the right path. God says you have to repent. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But you know what? Unless ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is the very first step as leading to true salvation. Right? Verse 11, For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after, this after salvation, sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. There has to be a little bit of fear there. Don't get me wrong, there's got to be fear there. Fearing God, realizing you're not keeping His commandments, is what leads you to that sorrow of having sorrow for sinning against God. What vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, and all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Repentance is the first step. And it's not works. It's a change of heart. It happens here. Right. Second step is believe. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. He's preaching to save sinners. I always point this out. You're standing in this gospel right here. And if you're not standing in this gospel, you're lost. Where, where do you stand? By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You skip, you skip step one, and step two, the head belief, we call it the head belief, but the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you're not believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that's a lie. If you skip step one, you're just believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, the, the devils believe. The lost world, all these false religions, they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, but they refuse to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They can say, I believe in the finished work. No, they don't. You've skipped repentance. If you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and it's because of your sins that he's on the cross, but you're going to tell me you don't have sorrow for that sin? Well, I love my sin. I have no problem with sin. Yeah, I put him on the cross, but hey, you know, you're a sinner, we're a sinner, we're all sinners. You think it's really going to deceive me that way? I was at one time as a false convert, deceived by all that. Uh, no, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we're going to get into it. Let's keep reading. Unless you believed in vain, for, in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how Jesus Christ died for our sins. Jesus died for those that would get saved, those who would come to the cross. Died for our sins, that's who the R is. Our sins according to the scripture. But they don't say that today. 
How many of you come across people that they say how Jesus died and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures? They leave that part out, how he died for our sins. They take that part out. I've heard good men of God slip up and make that mistake. You can't take that part out. The world loves taking that part out. It's just death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, it's how he died for our sins. How? Blood had to be shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And only a perfect sacrifice can take our sins away, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's the belief. That's the second step. Okay. Uh, confess both in prayer. This is what they're also taking out in days too. They're trying to take prayer out. Confess both in prayer. Romans 10, 8 says... But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if, it's a Bible if, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's future tense. Shalt be saved. You have to believe in your heart. We just talked about that step. And you've got to confess that belief and repentance. To God in prayer. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. God, Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Once again, to or unto means it leads to. This act leads to this act. The act of repentance, and I'm not talking about physical works, I'm talking about repentance Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer, leads to salvation. The act of God saving you. Okay? Just because I use the word act doesn't mean it's works. We've already done a study on that. They try to grab everything. Breathing is a work then. If you're breathing when you believe, you can't get saved. You've got to hold your breath. Because that's a work. No, what does the Bible define as works when it applies to salvation? That's what you need to make sure that they're not messing you up, brothers and sisters of Christ. All right. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know the people that are taking prayer out of salvation? They're ashamed. They didn't repent. It's just head belief. And they're ashamed of Jesus Christ. They refuse to confess it in prayer to God. Right? The fourth step, ask God to save you. Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all, which is rich unto all, that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you've come to him broken and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that the blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood, and it can take you, it can wash you clean of your sins. It can save you from hell and the everlasting fire, the lake of fire. You confess both in prayer. Now at that point, that's the whosoever. We've already done a study on this. That's the whosoever now. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have to meet these requirements. You have to follow these steps that are in the Bible. You skip any of these steps, that whosoever shall call upon the Lord, that's not talking about you. You've got to come to God on His terms. It's the true plan of salvation, and you're not doing anything works-wise to earn salvation. And like I said, step one, repent. Step two, belief. Step three, confession. St confessing both in prayer. Step four, both the repentance and belief in, in prayer. Step four, you ask God to save you. You know, you realize all four of these steps don't save you. You're coming to God on His terms. Like I said, absolutely. These four steps don't save you. Who saves you? God does. And He saves you by His grace. For by grace are you saved. Through the faith and repentance, belief, confessing both in prayer, and asking God that you've never seen to save you, and believing that He can save you, it takes through faith, but faith isn't what saves you. 
It's God's grace that saves you. I remember when we used to call them out on this, faith alone, it's faith alone. You know what they did when we called them out on this, Brother Jesus Christ? They went from saying, faith alone, faith alone to, it's, it's, um, 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 grace alone, through faith alone. Which goes against each other. It's either grace alone or it's faith alone. They name two things and say it's a, alone. But then again, most of them are the pagan trinity people. One plus one plus one equals one. When it, No, it equals three. I worship one God. God, the King James Bible. God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay, one God. But faith alone through grace alone? No, it isn't. Okay, it's by God's grace, period. We come to Him on His terms. He's told us how to come to Him on His terms. And this is how you get saved, brothers and sisters Christ. How you got saved, it's how I got saved. And if you didn't get saved this way, you need to get a King James Bible, and you need to follow the scriptures that I just mentioned, and you need to get come to God on His terms so He will save you. He'll save anybody that comes to Him on His terms. He's not picky. Oh, you did all these things. It's heartfelt. It came from the heart, not the head. I'm not going to save you. He won't do that. He's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want people to go to hell. You know who hell was created for? The devil and his angels. It wasn't created for mankind. If you wind up there, you wound up in a place that wasn't made for you and that you didn't have to go there. But there's a lot of people that are going there. Right. And I put, uh, time is running out, get saved today. 2 Corinthians 2, 6, 2, I love this verse. For he saith, I have heard thee, and a time accepted, and a day of salvation have I uh, secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The time to get saved is now. Not tomorrow. Today. All right. And if you've come across this video and you've been deceived like I was, I was a false convert for most of my life, raised in the Babel building systems on easy believism, uh, non-denominational. They had satanic style music. It was party time. It was a big club. They were using Bible perversions. And we weren't being taught the Word of God to hide God's Word in our heart because there is no perfect written Word of God. Pick out whatever Bible you want. There is no perfect written Word. And hold uh, sin and wickedness in your heart. The fun. Flesh is fun. Fun is flesh. It's all about having fun. My whole childhood growing up in the battle building system is running 100 miles an hour, being fleshly and sinful and just having fun. Yes, I still wore a suit and tie. Yes, I still sat there and sang these worldly hymns and that are flesh-style music. And I helped out. I played the bass guitar in the worship service. I did... Um, Taught Sunday school for the grade school kids. Um, I did a lot of things in there. I even went to Bible college for a year. Right? But I was deceived. I wasn't taught the Bible version issue. I wasn't taught the true plan of salvation. And there was no changed life after salvation. One of the things I kind of skipped here was the changed life after salvation. I put that in the comments too. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says... Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what they hate. The reason they don't want to truly get saved and born again is someone who truly gets saved and born again. The Bible says, Know ye not that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to God. He owns you. He tells you what to do and you do it. That's someone who's saved. Truly saved and born again. There's times where God says, Don't do this. And we still fail Him sometimes and do it. There's times where God says, do this, and we fail Him sometimes still as a saved sinner. But our heartfelt attitude, for the most part, is God commands, we obey. Someone who's truly saved and born again. But that's, they don't want the changed life. They want to have the world and go to heaven at the same time. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever thou soweth, thou shalt ye also reap. That's for both saved and lost, but... I'm using this for people that pretend to be Christians, pretend to be in the faith, and say they want the world and get to go to heaven at the same time. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Change life. But they hate that. They hate to change life after salvation. The reason they accuse us of works-based salvation, brothers and Christ, is they don't want to change life. They love their sin. They've never come to God broken and having sorrow for the world's way, the sinful, wicked way, of their, their life in this wicked world. They've never come to Him like that. They just have head belief and they're part of a club. Right? Uh, Ephesians 4.24 says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Jesus said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Paul comes down in the Corinthians for their sin and wickedness. You're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. He doubts their salvation. They're so fleshly that he doubts their salvation. Read Romans chapter 8. It defines the difference between someone who's saved and who's lost. Carly minded walking after the flesh is someone who's lost. Spiritually minded walking after the spirit is someone who's saved. You can still stumble. You can still fail the Lord sometimes. But you have that heartfelt, I want God to open the scriptures to me through his spirit. And I want to listen to God and do what he wants. And when you fail him, you feel awful. You have that sorrow, that conviction. You just feel like junk, dirt, lower than dirt when you fail the Lord. I, I do. This is a changed life. Right. I put on here, I'm not the closet Catholic here. I'm the King James Bible believing, God fearing man in this conversation. If you check the true plan of salvation found in the pages of the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English, then you know your destination. These people who play religion, and you know they have their religion and they play uh, Christians, they play like they're Bible believers and whatnot. A lot of times I get attacked by people that just flat out aren't Bible believers. Um, but lately you get attacked by people who claim to be King James Bible believers, but they're not. In words, but not in deed. Right? But if you reject the God's way of getting saved, you know where you're going. They know about hell. Um, Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The Bible talks about, and this is what it reminds us, when it talks about Jesus, uh, not Jesus, uh, Satan, being transformed into an angel of light, and no marvel for his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness. Now stop. The last, they always try to stop there. Ministers of righteousness. In other words, they, have, they talk the talk. They talk the talk. And the Bible said, if you keep following that scripture, it says, whose end is according to their works. There's two parts to that. That's how we judge them, according to their works. Brother and sister Christ, don't judge me on my words. Judge me on my deeds. When I fail God, hold me accountable. When I'm walking the walk, okay. If I'm not walking the walk, Correct me to bring me back up so I get back on the straight and narrow so I'm walking the walk along with talking the talk. But it's the works that you judge. And why is that? But the second part, well, why is that? Because you can get deceived by words. The Bible says by good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. You can be deceived by words. But the works seem to shine through. You back people in the corner that talk the talk, you back them into a corner, their works come out. The real fruit comes out. Okay? The second part to that is it's saying that these so-called ministers of righteousness, the, their end, their end is going to be according to their works. What's the end? The judgment. You've got the judgment seat of Christ for saved. You've got the great white throne, which I believe there might be some saved there. But predominantly it's for lost people, where everybody that's ever lost that's in hell, because it says death and hell were brought up to be judged, and they're cast in the lake of fire. They're being judged on their works. They're not being judged by Jesus Christ. I mean, they're being judged by Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, but they're not being judged by what Jesus did. At the judgment seat of Christ, we get judged by what Jesus did for us. Innocent. Jesus paid the price. Your sins are washed clean. Now, I'm not innocent as far as I'm still a sinner, but I'm saying the ultimate cost of sin, I'm judged by Jesus Christ by what he did. 
the lost world is going to be judged by Jesus Christ, but by their works. Their works. Right? It's a serious thing. And the most dangerous, I've said this before, the most dangerous people, include, it was me. I was one of those most dangerous people to deal with. To have a profession of faith. At the time that God reached me, I'd stopped going to the Babel buildings. I'd, I'd given up on them. I just, I was empty. Things weren't right. I had no peace. I had no joy. I was just all fleshly. Really getting into Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games to the point where I was playing them six to eight to ten hours a day. I, I, I got to the point where I was just worthless and meaningless. I was just, I was depressed and sorrowful. Just, I was, I, I was just at that broken point. And God showed me the Bible version issue. And then God showed me the true plan of salvation. And after God saved me and I followed these steps and God saved me, my life has never been the same. That old man, I, sometimes you try to resurrect the old man and God teaches you that there is no resurrecting him. You're, you're going to be miserable. When I was lost and enjoying the flesh, now that I'm saved and I start backpedaling, I'm miserable. It's never the same. There is no going back. Why? Because the changed life. Okay. I put in here, P.S. My past mistakes does not change the truth of, of the Word of God, nor change my responsibility to speak God's Word. I have to always throw that in there because what they try to do, Brother Sister Christ, is they'll try to grab mistakes of your past. And they try to hold that against you so they don't have to believe the truth that you're preaching. Be careful about that. If you're prince, I, I've told you this before, Brother Christ, you can lose your testimony with people. If they catch you present tense doing things you're not supposed to do, and you're failing the Lord, and you're setting a bad example, you can lose your testimony with people where the preaching of the gospel is just going to fall on deaf ears with them because you've lost your testimony with them. You've been, they caught you being a hypocrite. I've lost my testimony with people because it was my fault. It's possible to lose your testimony, but no matter what happens, we've got to keep trying to march on for the Lord. And we need to keep being a living witness as well as a verbal witness. All right. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, his appearing in the sky, the catching away of the body of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And his kingdom, at the end of the a thousand reign of Jesus Christ, Satan's going to get loose for a little while, and then God's going to destroy the old earth, the old heaven, and then that's judgment time. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Sometimes we look at out of season, we think, well, the world doesn't want it, but I'm still going to try to preach it to them. There's times, brother says Christ, that you're going to fall flat on your face. And you're going to fail the Lord. You're going to fail the brethren. God's going to work on you. He's going to pick you back up. You're going to repent. You're going to forsake. And what do you do? you got to get back to doing living for the Lord. you got to get back to preaching the gospel. you got to get back to standing for the word of God. And the life that you're living. And yes, you might have lost testimonies out of season. Because you screwed up. I'm, t I'm talking about this as a witness, when you, uh, you know, it's a testimony, it's happened to me because I failed the Lord, and I failed the brethren before. You might lose your testimony, but you've got to get back up and keep going again. Out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. That's what this whole study that he's responding to is all about, exhorting the brethren. Have you exhorted a brother in Christ lately? Or are you getting stuck in the... The backbiting, the whispering, the bearing false witness, like this guy's doing right here. You're teaching works-based salvation. I told you, I just showed you the salvation that the Bible teaches that I stand for, and it's not about works. It's about you coming broken, and they don't want to come broken. Okay. Also, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. The only reason people won't get saved, they love their sin, they don't want to give up their sin. 
they don't want to throw their iniquity at the foot of the cross. I didn't say quit it as far as, I said give it up, but what I mean by give it up is you throw it at the foot of the cross. It's sin, it's wickedness. I don't want it anymore. I'm stuck with it, but I don't want it anymore. I don't want to sin against God. I don't want to do wrong by God. I'm sorry, Lord, for this sin. I'm sorry for my sinful, wicked state. I am worthless. Bad for their own lusts. That's another reason brethren fall away. People who are truly saved and born again. Worldliness. The flesh, the world, and Satan get their hooks in them and pull them away. The lusts. Uh, but after their own lusts. Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears? They'll pick out the, the, the preachers that tell them what they want to hear. Tickle their ears. Oh, that's a good. I want to hear that. Oh, yes, I want to hear that. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Right here, the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. Oh, it's faith alone, faith alone. We've asked him chapter and verse where it says faith alone. In Hebrews it says, without uh, faith uh, being, with faith without works being alone is dead being alone. I'm sorry. Faith without works is dead being alone. Now there's instruction in righteousness and there's doctrine. Doctrinally, it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. You take the mark, your faith means nothing if you take the mark of the beast because you're you lost your salvation, and you're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn for all eternity in that dispensation, which isn't for today. The body of Christ will not be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. But there's that application of that verse, and the other application for instruction in righteousness is people who truly have faith, who truly have faith, there's going to be works to back it up. Someone says, I believe, and their whole life is nothing but a, like a servant of Satan, Satanist, I'm sorry, I don't think you're saved. I don't think you truly believe. I think you're lying to me. You see how that works? Faith by itself? Faith is never alone. Go ahead. Bible never teaches that salvation is faith alone. And they shall turn away from the ears and be turned into fables. Then I did a P.S. real quick, because I want to address this. P.S. He brings up... Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 16. If you want to pause the video, you can read it. It's talking about the qualifications for a bishop and the qualifications for a deacon. And I went ahead and threw elder in here, ordained elder. We have elders in the church, but are you an ordained elder? Okay, but I said, P.S., I am not a bishop, nor a deacon, nor an ordained elder. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 16 does not apply to me. I try my best to qualify, make sure that I'm living for the Lord, I'm walking the walk, not just talking the talk. I make sure there's times in my life where I didn't qualify for these three at all. There's times that I did. Then there's times that I'd stumble and fall and be like, okay, now I don't qualify. But my heartfelt desire is to always try to qualify. But I'm not a bishop. I've never said I'm a bishop. I've never said I was a deacon. I'm not. I don't have a house church. And I've said this before. There are men online behind the camera on a video uh, like YouTube and Rumble and BitChute. Like, they think they're bishops. They're not. They think they're ordained elders. They're not. They don't really say de deacon. It's always bishop or ordained elder. But they're not. Where's their house church? Making a Bible study video and putting it on a platform for videos doesn't make you a bishop. I said, it doesn't apply to me. And then I put 1 Corinthians 12, 27. That does apply to me. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. It's talking about everybody. And God has set some in the church, first apostles... Secondary prophets. Now, some of these are for, for men only. Some for, are for men and women. Okay. Apostles. There was 12 apostles. There's no more apostles for today. They, that was when Jesus was here. And then uh, Paul, I've already proven this, Paul was the, the 12th apostle. The guy that they chose, Paul, uh, Peter and them, were like drawing lots to say, okay, between God, you have to choose between these two people. And the guy that they chose, they said he was an apostle. God didn't. They did, and I proved that in the scriptures. 
And then Paul says, here's my proof that I am an apostle. There's only 12 apostles. Paul was the 12th apostle. But there's no apostles today, but they were when this was written. They were apostles. First, apostles. They were the first. Secondly, prophets. Third, teachers. That's what I am. I'm just a Bible teacher. Teachers. After that, miracles. And when it comes to teachers, elder women are allowed to teach the younger women good things, and the Bible lists what they're supposed to be teaching. How to have a meek and quiet spirit. How to be chaste. How to be a keeper at home. How to love your husband. How to raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. How to obey your husband. Those are the, it's a boundary, but elder women can teach the younger women. They can be teachers, but under the boundaries of what the Bible says. And then men teaching the Word of God. Okay? Elder men teaching younger men how to be good men of God when they grow up. How to take care, how to wash their wife by the watering of a word. How to provide. How to protect. Okay? Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Helps. Governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets. Are all teachers. See, some people get confused and they think that if you're one of these things, you have to qualify for all of them. No. Okay. Teachers are all workers of miracles. How do we know this? Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues. Do all interpret it. Here's the first 31. But, negating what they were just saying, are all apostles or all pro No, we're not. But, here's the important part. Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. If God's given you a gift, shown you the word of God to make Bible studies, make some Bible studies. But his, his failing is they always try to grab uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I never said I was a bishop. In fact, I don't have a house church. Okay? And I've already talked about this as an ordained elder. One of the qualifications to be an ordained elder is you have to be least esteemed among the church. The ordained elders handle the donations and they judge worldly matters. Between brethren. This brother's wrong, this brother, with the worldly thing, bring them to us, the ordained elders, they're the ones that will judge the matter. And the reason you want them to be least esteemed is you don't want that respecter of persons. Oh, I, I, I know this guy, he's my best friend, so I'm going to side with him regardless of right or wrong. That's why you don't want someone who's highly esteemed, you want someone who's least esteemed among the church that's ordained as an ordained elder. Plus, they handle the money. Like I said, you don't want people that are uh, respecter of persons, okay, that, are, that uh, are corrupt in how they deal with the money and how they deal with the judgment. But I'm not one of those three. I'm just teaching the Word of God. I put out Bible studies on YouTube preaching the Word of God. And it's not very popular today. It just really isn't. People love those videos. I don't do them that much, but people really love those videos that have a lot of drama in it. Drama, 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 drama. I go, you got to be calling out this person. Why aren't you calling out that person? Why aren't you calling... We want drama, 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 drama. That's what's popular online today. You see it with, with the drama about politics. Drama about sodomy that's going on out there. Drama about feminism that's going on out there. And I'm going to make a comment real quick. I really noticed a lot of the so-called people standing up for what's right. I mean, what they say, kind of like, it's right according to the scriptures. But they're not using the scriptures. They're using... Morals. The, it's mankind's moral standards. Most of them that are standing up, they're Jesuits. Catholic and Jesuit. Trying to stand up with, with so-called what is right. But people are getting distracted by all the drama. The debating. The arguing. The calling each other out. They really, the lost world really thrives on that stuff. I don't. I'm here to preach the word of God. I don't get into a lot of that drama stuff. Okay. Here I put on here, doing Bible studies on YouTube or any other platform, whether it be audio or video, does not make you a bishop or deacon or ordained elder. Having a physical flock house church is where these three come in. The church at Corinth. The church at Philippi. Right? 
the church at Ephesus. It's a physical flock there. And when you have a physical flock, body of Christ there, that's where the uh, uh, deacons come in. That's where bishops come in. That's why you have ordained elders to help keep things in order. It's the it's way God sets it up. I'm just a man out here, and it feels like I'm out here in the middle of nowhere by myself, but I'm in the state of Oregon, and I haven't come across any brothers or sisters in Christ in the state of Oregon that want a fellowship. I fellowship with people all around the world through a video chat, but I'm not a bishop, I'm not a deacon. When people have a so-called full-time ministry on a, on a video platform like YouTube, they're not bishops and deacons and, and ordained elders either. They're just preachers and teachers. Now, you still have to be ordained of God at that. I remember reading a verse, I don't think I put it down here, where it says, Paul's talking about how God ordained me to do all these things, be a, but he ordained him to be an apostle. I'm not ordained to be an apostle. Um, and a preacher and a teacher. I'm talking about those three things. God's the one that still calls us to do these things. Absolutely. It's not me saying, I deserve to do this, therefore I'm going to do it. I mean, I get more slack, I get more attacks than I do uh, exhorting. This whole video, have you exhorted a brother in Christ lately? I get more attacks than I ever do getting exhorted. I'm not doing this for the fun. Victoria's barking right now. I, I said, doing a Bible study on YouTube or platform, whether it be audio or video, does not make you a bishop or deacon or ordained elder. <laughs> Having a physical flock, house church is where these three come in. Nice try, though. I put that in a nice try, and I put down Romans 16, 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Because he grabs from the scripture that doesn't apply to me. I'm not jumping up saying I'm a bishop, I'm a deacon, I'm an ordained elder. But the verse that I just quoted there, he didn't quote. Why is that? That does apply to me. Applies to you too, brother, says Christ. Whatever gifts God has given you to serve him and live for him, you need to be coveting those gifts. And what that means there, coveting, is not the bad way. It's talking about rely on those strengths and let them grow. Use them. Live for the Lord. Shine for the Lord. Okay? Uh, Romans 16, like I said, For they have such to serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And I tell it seems like you need to do more to 2 Timothy 2.15, but first I would drop the pride, because the whole statement, like I said, you shouldn't, he grabbed a past sin that I had. I have been through a divorce. Uh, he passed a, a past mistake that I made, repented on, and I'm back, getting back to serving the Lord. And in that situation, I wasn't at fault. I made mistakes in my marriage, but I wasn't at fault for that divorce. My ex-wife was. She was 100% at fault. And to this day, she doesn't take responsibility. Okay? She was responsible for that divorce. But the point is, is he's dropped the pride, he attacks me personally, then says I'm not saved, and then says, you know, tries to quote scripture and take it out of context. Okay? But first I drop the pride, the bitterness, the hate, the envy, and the love of unrighteousness. I just threw it all in there. I don't know particularly what's preventing him from coming to the King James Bible and believing it's God's perfect written word and believing the true plan of salvation out of this book. I don't know what's preventing him. I just threw that down. And there's probably, I probably missed something. But there's probably other things you could have thrown down that will only get in the way. If you're going to do something 2 Timothy 15, you need to get saved. I gave him the gospel. And after you get saved, you need to drop all this stuff. The pride, the bitterness, the hate, the envy, the love of unrighteousness. And you need to trust God. And you need to trust His Word. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I was reading this this morning. This man's all talk. And I know sometimes you can say, well, you're all talk because I have a video platform. You don't actually get to see how I live. But I've had an open door policy for a brethren that fellowship with me for a while. And I believe you're saved. Come visit me. You're welcome to come visit. I don't just let anybody come over because some of you just met. You don't know who they are. They can have a profession of faith, but you don't know if they're truly saved. But I've had brethren that I said, hey, you're welcome to come by any time. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. 
cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. Made manifest in our body. And I got to think in this, and you go back up to chapter, uh, go up to verse 3. All right, so go to 2. It says, But hath renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded, blinded, not made deaf. We're out here preaching truth. They don't want it. It's not death that he made him. He made him blind. They're not seeing what they are. They're not coming to God broken as a dirty, filthy, rotten, low-down, no-good sinner on their way to hell, and they deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, their Creator, Almighty God, and they need to have sorrow for it. But they don't see their really true condition. There are sinners on their way to hell. Some of them have been deceived into believing that, oh, I get to go to heaven, I can still have this world, and I get to go to heaven. They've been deceived. You need to repent. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, the one thing I found, brothers and Christ, that goes across every dispensation in the Bible, the chance to repent. Repentance. Every dispensation. Except eternity future. The eight, at least say the eighth dispensation is eternity with our Lord and Savior. We don't know what that truly entails, but it's going to be amazing. Blinded the minds of them which believe not. Blinded. Not made them deaf where they can't hear the truth. Blinded. They can't see the truth. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. This is a great chapter to read, brothers, says Christ, talking about we're supposed to be a living example. Not just a verbal, a living example. And God will blind the minds of the lost world that even our living example, they, it still won't lead people to Christ. They will still choose the world, and they still will choose their sin in the end. Okay. So, um, the changed life, not being words. He says he's an ambassador for Jesus Christ, but he didn't once preach. That's the part that gets to me, going back to this, the conversation. He didn't once preach the gospel to me. I do that all the time. I preach the gospel to him on here. I link the gospel message. I link the verses that back the, God, the true plan of salvation, the gospel message from the King James Bible. They always come back and say, you're lost. Okay, you believe I'm lost. Yeah, you're lost. You believe I'm a heretic. You're a heretic. Okay, you believe, you know, I'm a servant of Satan. You're a servant of Satan. Okay, now what? Now what? I just wanted to call you names and, 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 and everything. That's all I wanted to do. Okay, I'm done. I'm gone. And they disappear. No more comments. They just disappear. Why? Why did they preach the gospel to me? The true plan of salvation. Why aren't they witnessing to me? You're wrong here, man. You're just 100% wrong. Okay, why aren't you witnessing to me? Show me where I'm wrong according to the scriptures. Why do you just come in name-calling, holding past sins against you? Sometimes they'll make up stuff against you, bear false witness, and they throw in this, they're, they're two cents worth, and then pff, they're gone. Brother Jesus Christ, I because it comes up a lot. I have this study right here. I've had it for a year. I'm sorry about the barking. I'm just trying to get this done, and then I'll go see what she wants. She's on the couch, and Victoria's legs are hurting, so she probably wants down from the couch. But, um, but I real quick, I got this teaching right here that I haven't done in over a year. Brian came out, Brian Denlinger came out with a, t a teaching attacking brethren that are, that are been through a divorce. And he says in the teachings, beware of divorced preachers. Okay. And bishops, deacons, I still challenge, where does it say that if you've been through a divorce, you're not qualified to be a bishop, deacon, or bishop? It says you're going to be the husband of one wife. There's men that have gotten divorces in their lost lives, sinful, wicked men that they were, and God turns them around and saves them. And they start living for the Lord. And they get married, they get remarried to a godly woman, and they serve the Lord the rest of their lives, and they've been through a divorce, but they're still married to one woman, the, the, the husband of one wife, legally, and God, according to God's word. I say legally, state-wise, but it's according to God's word. Their past sins are forgiven. Now you need to live for the Lord. 
And I came out with a study that says the number one preacher to be aware of today. And I've had this study set in here for a long time because I didn't want to come out with it like I'm just, like what just said right there, drop the envy, the bitterness, the hate, the pride. I don't want to come out with this like that when he's coming out attacking people. Because Brian doesn't want the fingers pointed here. He wants the fingers pointed everywhere else. I hate to say it like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not telling you to stay away from the man, okay? I'm just saying I came out with a teaching to rebuttal that and say, you want to know what the Bible teaches? The number one, there's two types of preachers you've got to be aware of. Wolves in sheep's clothing. I'll just go ahead and summarize it. The wolf in sheep's clothing and preachers that were once in a standing point and then they fall away. I believe those are the most dangerous creatures out there because they were once in a standing point. They collect this cult atmosphere of following, get as many people to follow them, and then when they start falling away, guess what happens to the people that follow them? They start falling away. It's one thing to say, hey, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Absolutely. We need to push those. But I believe the most dangerous creature today based off the scripture, is a preacher that once stood for absolute truth, got saved the Bible way, was a Bible believer, believed in the, the doctrines, believed in the instruction righteous, had love for the brethren, had love for the lost world by preaching the gospel to them, a love preaching the gospel to them, had a love for the brethren. And what happens? When that preacher starts falling away, they lead people astray. Those are the number one preachers to watch out for. And I've got this whole study here with scriptures to back it up galore. But I said over here because it's like, I'm going to ask you, Brother Christ, do you, th do you want the, the, for me to do this study, the number one preacher to bear the intro, or just get back to the series of studies that we're doing? I mean, it's just here because it's like, I don't want to come out with this and have people think, oh, he's just trying to attack him personally. No, I believe that he made some good points in that study. He did, but he didn't tell the whole truth. He didn't tell the whole thing. You need to be watching. There's, there's married people that's only been married once. You need to watch out for them. There's people that are single. You need to watch out for There's people that have been divorced. Yes, you need to watch out for them. But I know great preachers that aren't married that serve the Lord, and they're great preachers. I know great preachers that have only been married once that serve the Lord, and they love His Word. I know great preachers that have been through one, two, three, I think two divorces. I'm thinking Peter Ruckman been through a couple divorces, and they still love the Word of God. They still made mistakes. They still had their faults where they were in error. But he loved the Lord and served the Lord to his dying day. Okay? It's not whether you're married, divorced, or single. It's about this. What is your stance on this? Do you line up with the Word of God? Or are you starting to line up with the flesh? I can't do it because I have but I'm just The flesh or the world? Are you starting to line up with the world and the flesh and straying from this? This is the foundation. Okay. But like I said, I have a teaching here. I was going to do it, but I, some brethren were telling me, hey, you got to be careful with some of the teachings you come out with. It makes it sound like you're just perfectly trying to go after him. I'm not. I'm trying to warn the brethren. And I'm trying to protect the brethren. Okay. You need to make sure that you need to be aware of preachers that once stood for absolute truth and now they're falling away. Those are the most dangerous preachers out there because people will stick with them out of respect for their persons. They won't stick with Jesus Christ and his perfect written word because they started worshiping that man and not Jesus Christ. That man became the final authority, not the word of God. That's the danger. And I have said I have to study on it in Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. So I'm going to end this. Brother says Christ, to be careful. Don't get discouraged by people like that. Be careful. I just get frustrated. They don't preach the gospel to me. And they misuse Scripture when they do quote Scripture. And mostly they just want to come on there and say, You're lost. You're lost. You're a heretic. You're nothing. Okay, now what? Oh, I just wanted to say that. Hee <laughs> hee. Bye bye. And they take off. They're not serving God. He's not an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Make sure that you're not just words, but deed. And make sure we're getting out there, brothers and Christ, still handing out gospel tracts, still witnessing for Jesus Christ with our words and our deeds. It's so important in these last days. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.